Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Robinson. I'm minister here at Gorse Hill Baptist Church, and it's my joy and my privilege to welcome you to this morning's service of worship. We're live here from our building in Gorse Hill in Swindon, and uh, we pray especially for you as you're listening now, or if you're listening later on in the week, either on Zoom, uh, Facebook, or via our YouTube channel. We pray that God will bless you through what you hear and what you share together. If you're at home, please sing uh, with our worship group as we sing loudly together. We have a number of our friends and members here in the congregation, uh, and uh, each week we're inviting people to join us. Unfortunately, we can't sing, but we're blessed by having a wonderful worship group uh, led by Pete this morning, who will be leading our sung worship. Let's begin with a moment of quiet. Incidentally, I would add that there is a chat window opportunity and facility for you to use if you wish to, uh, to comment on, uh, uh, on, on the service, to add anything. There might be a question I ask you, so you can respond to that question during the course of the service. But let's just spend a moment in quiet. I'll lead us in prayer together. We thank you, O Lord God, for the many good things that you have given to us. We thank you for the joy of this day where we can meet, gather together. We thank you for the wonder of technology that enables us to be together even though we may be apart. We thank you for your word, the Bible, the scriptures that speak into our lives day by day, moment by moment. And pray, Lord, that as we open these words today, as we hear and listen, and as we consider how these words may impact our lives, so, Lord, we would be those who say, thank you, God, for all that you have given. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you, God, for one another. And thank you, God, for meeting me where I am at this moment in my life today. For that is where God wishes to meet you and I this morning. We ask this in God's name, that he may be blessed. Amen. We're going to pray together uh, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. They came to Jesus, and isn't it strange that people of faith who had been used to going to the synagogue did not know how to pray, and yet Jesus taught them a prayer and ask them to pray in this way. And so we follow in that call to pray, saying together in, in the version of the prayer that we know best or in the language that we speak clearest and uh, comes to us, first of all, we speak and pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We've been praying that most weeks through lockdown. It does unite us with one another virtually and physically, but also with believers across the world. I'm going to ask Pete and the worship group to join me, and they're going to lead us in the first of two sets of songs. So feel free to praise God quietly in your heart if you're here in the building or out loud if you're at home. It's hard not to sing along, I have to say, when we're in the building, but our hearts can be lifted up in praise. So thanks, Pete and the worship group. It's over to you. Thank you. Okay, right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the worship part of this morning's service. As Steve said, my name is Pete. Uh, but before I start, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, well, some thoughts I've been having recently. So recently, I've been reading through the book of Daniel, and it's reminded me of one of my stories, one of my favorite stories of, I can never pronounce their names right, but it's Meshach, how's it go, Steve? Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it's the story of them being thrown into the furnace. Now, I'm not sure if you, um, it reminds me of my favorite internet meme, which is a cartoon of words on, and there's, in this picture, people normally send it as a time when things are going bad, and they're just dealing with it, which is basically this cartoon cat sat in the middle of flames, and he's just saying, this is okay, and he's got a nice little cup of tea. 
And that just kind of reminds me of that story because in the story, despite the fact that everything going on, despite the fact of being thrown into this furnace, you know, this, this angel of the Lord has come and sat with them and everything is okay. And that's just kind of really struck with me about the last year, however long now, that the Lord has still been with us during this whole time. So just what I'd share with you. And as we come to worship, I'm just going to ask just to close your eyes and bow your heads as we pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that over the last year or so that you've been with us. You've never left us. Lord, you, you are always there and we can always rely on you to come through for us. We thank you. Amen. So we're going to sing, we'll start by singing two songs. And first one, we're going to need some instruments. Now, obviously, if you're at church, there are no instruments. But at home, I really hope that you're going to be playing along uh, and singing along as loud as you can. So we'll start by singing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Father, we thank you that we can lift your name on high, Lord. We thank you that we can really praise. And while we're not praising here in the church, Lord, we know that people at home, people on Facebook and Zoom, we are praising you. And even here in our hearts, Lord, we are really worshipping you. And we just pray that we will lift up our spirits to you now. Amen. So we're going to sing another song now, uh, which haven't sung here I don't think in a while but it's really amazing that the chorus just kind of runs through these amazing adjectives of how uh, amazing God is it starts with indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation reveal in your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature you song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky, 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 you place the stars in the sky
place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All oh, powerful, untamable, all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go Or see heavenly storehouses laden with snow Who imagined the sun and give source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God All-powerful, untamable All-struck we fall to our knees As we humbly proclaim You are amazing God Indescribable, uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God Incomparable, unchangeable You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same You are amazing God You are amazing God You are amazing God You are amazing God Isn't it wonderful to be able to to be able to speak to God and, and to know God. Of course, we cannot know God fully, but that that we can know of God is incredible, amazing. You know, we, we struggle to find the words by which we can describe that feeling that we have of knowing that God, the creator of the universe, cares intimately about each one of us and cares deeply and cares daily and cares momentarily about each one of us. And that is the most amazing thing. The God who put the stars in the sky has created you and I and knows all about us. Over the course of the next few weeks, there's going to be, I think, a lot of changes that happen. Of course, we're thinking about what might happen when COVID restrictions are, are released more. Uh, alongside of that, our church AGM comes on the 20 off, 20th of May. Uh, we've had three nominations, one for the diaconate and one for treasurer and one for secretary. Um, you may have seen on the notice sheet that Matt Wright has been nominated to the diaconate, uh, that Shirley uh, Westall has been nominated uh, for church secretary and Ian Burbage nominated for uh, church treasurer. We give thanks for Lars, whose term of service is now finished and is standing down. So we thank you for all the work that Lars has done. Uh, this week, there's not a pastoral drop-in on Monday, as it's a bank holiday, but on Wednesday at 2pm and Friday at 11 are our two drop-ins. So if you want to chat, pop in and see someone different, zoom in, and, uh, and there's someone there who, who will be talking to you. Today, we're continuing in our... our a series of sermons following the encounters of people uh, with Jesus following his resurrection, the appearances, the, 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 the encounters, the changes that he brought to people's lives. Today we're looking at Matthew chapter 8, chapter 28, 
which is our calling for mission. That is, not simply to sit with what we've got, but to go out to the world around us. We'll be seeing a video clip a bit later on which illustrates the kind of mission work that we are doing as a church. But before that, I want to play a video clip which will encourage us all about prayer. We're making prayer a big priority over the course of the next month. From the 13th of May to the 23rd of May, there is a prayer initiative called Thy Kingdom Come. That is happening across the churches in Swindon. But from the 24th of May onwards, 23rd of May onwards, here at Gorse Hill, uh, Colin and Truth will be setting up a prayer room and there'll be opportunities for us to pray as a church. So in the middle of May, there's a commitment for us as churches to pray, firstly, broadly, secondly, more focused. And uh, a video clip that we're going to see now will tell us a bit more about the prayer room. So, so thank you uh, to our IT guys. We're going to see that prayer, uh, prayer video now. Thank you. Have you ever wondered why so many people pray? Well, Albert Einstein said that there's really only two ways to live, as if nothing's a miracle or as if everything's a miracle. Either life's a fluke and we're just a bunch of highly evolved animals on a big rock lost in space, or there's a creator behind creation, a, a God behind goodness. And if so, then connecting with him in prayer is pretty much the most mind-blowing thing you can do. Archaeologists keep digging stuff up that shows we've always prayed. People of many faiths pray daily. Even atheists submit to praying sometimes. Real prayer is a two-way conversation with the living God who loves and listens to the things we say. Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it'll be done. We have a chance to ask for peace, healing, help or whatever we need. Life matters, you matter, your choices, thoughts, prayers and actions echo in eternity. But in case you hadn't noticed, God is pretty much invisible and not always easy to hear. There are distractions, disappointments and questions that we all share. That's why 24-7 prayer does stuff to help thousands of people in hundreds of places connect with God in new ways. People are learning to pray by just praying. Why don't you take on the challenge of a 24-7 prayer room? Just gather your friends, find a place, pick a week, get creative in the space and fill every hour of the week with a chain of prayer. Prayer vigils like these have been changing lives for 2,000 years. And today, millions are discovering that God's real. Life's a miracle. And the most powerful thing you can ever do is to pray. I wonder when and why you pray. I guess if you've got a problem that you don't know how to fix, it's beyond you, then of course you pray. But I wonder, do you ever pray just because you want to talk to God? Uh, I had an office when I was pastoring a church in the church building itself, and there was a church office it was a time when there weren't many mobile phones around and so most calls came via the landline, they would go to the church office and then they would be passed on to me if necessary. But sometimes I'd be so busy, I would say to the people in the church office, please don't pass on any calls, just tell the people that uh, uh, I will call them back. Having said that, they knew that if my daughter in university called, they'd put her through straight away, regardless of what I'd said. Because there was no voice sweeter to me to hear than that of my daughter. And we'd talk about, well, I don't know, sometimes she'd talk about problems. And I was her dad. I wanted to be the first person that she spoke to about those sorts of things. But we would talk about how studies going, how's life going. Uh, and some we'd even talk about the weather, for goodness sake, from time to time. The point being that I just loved talking to my daughter. And if, as a father, 
I feel like that about talking to my daughter, whom I love, how much more does God love it when we speak to him, just to talk to him? Of course, when we come to the week of prayer, we can spend time talking about our problems, choices we have to make, the things that we're concerned about, and so on. But do you know, God wants you to spend time with him, just to spend time with him, because there is no voice sweeter to God than that of his people talking to him. Do you know in, in Revelation it says that when the saints, and that's us, pray, heaven goes silent. God loves it so much when we spend time talking to him, just to talk to him and to listen to him as well. That's the aim of our week of prayer, to spend time with God. In whatever way, as it said in the video, you can talk about all sorts of things to God, but please talk to God, because he loves it. We'll be sending out some more instructions during this week via email uh, about uh, the week of prayer. If you're not sure about anything, please contact me. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Colin. It's vitally important that we pray because prayer is communication with God. It is both speaking and, and listening, but also being, being, as Colin said, in the presence of God, that God may, as it were, soak into us. But perhaps at this time in the life of the church and the nation, I would be bold enough, I would say, uh, and daring enough to say, it's vital that we pray. We simply cannot see very far into the future. And we need to keep in step with God's Holy Spirit and with what God is doing. And doing that means to pray, because otherwise we will miss God's understanding. So yes, prayer as prayer, but prayer with purpose as well. So I encourage you to join with me in prayer together. I, I'm going to give you an illustration of prayer by reading something from Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read a few verses, uh, and that gives us an illustration of what prayer is all about. It's how the early church begin to respond to the circumstances where they find themselves. Our theme for this morning is about mission. Peter and John have gone out and have spoken boldly about what is going on, uh, about Jesus Christ. Let me just read for you Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 25, uh, and in fact through to, to verse 31. On their release from prison, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices in prayer together. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why? Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the holy people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in prayer this building, this town were shaken and that we would be given the words to speak boldly to our community, to our friends, to our neighbours beyond the, the environs of this church. But it began when they prayed. The first thing they did was to pray. Did you notice that? They came away from the court, away from being held up and, and criticised for what they said. The first thing they did was to pray and to pray together. And they prayed clearly, putting it before God, what had gone on. So there's a challenge for you and I. We're going to pray for a few moments now. After which, we've got another video clip, which gives an idea of something of the outreach of the mission activity that's going on through the church, even though we may not be meeting together. But let us now pray. 
I'm not going to fill this prayer time with lots of words. I, I would like to leave space where we can pray in the quiet of our heart and pray quietly at home. But think on that story that I've just read. In the encounters that you face day by day, what's your first reaction? Will you pray? Will you join me now in praying for the church and for the world? The nations rage, the people battle in vain. Those were the words that Peter and John uh, and those around them prayed into and about. They had found themselves, Peter and John, in a very difficult position and yet had remained true to their calling and had spoken clearly and openly about their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. At a time of change in the life of our nation, O Lord, we need to speak as clearly, as openly, as defiantly, as powerfully as these two men have spoken to our nation, to our community. We simply cannot see. We simply do not know what the next few weeks will hold. And yet we know that we are called to stand in and amongst the people who will be facing change, seeking to understand what's going on. So, Lord, give us boldness, we pray. Give us openness, we pray. And, Lord, give us power, we pray. That it would be both us and it would be both the church, your church in this nation, that is shaken and which will be that which will shake others. Now is our time to stand and to make clear what it means to be a believer. We have followed, O oh Lord, over these past weeks how different people have encountered Jesus, how they found him, how they've seen him, how they've, how they've reacted to him and how they've been changed as a result. I pray, Lord, that as we have moved through this Easter season, that we have not remained unchanged, but that we are now different. That having heard the stories that we've perhaps heard time and time again, that now we're different. Now we see that Jesus makes such a difference. Now we see what power is. Now we see what openness is. Now we see what true life is. But now we see what our responsibility must be. We pray, O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for ourselves and for our church, for our nation, for our community, for our government, for our royal family, for all those in authority. Lord, you have no voice but ours. Let us be bold in speaking out. Let us be resolute in prayer. And Lord, let us be ready to respond in all circumstances, just as Peter and John were. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. We've now a, a short video clip which emphasises something of the mission giving that we undertake as a church. But of course we appreciate that you and many others listening give to other mission agencies, give in other ways. So this is but a small illustration of how what we can give can make a big difference. So, so thank you to Brian and, and for Dave for putting this together. We're just going to have a look at this. Then we'll have a Bible reading that Mari is going to bring to us. And we will think about what it means to be missionary disciples. So thank you. Let's see the video.
Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thanks be to God. As you saw from that video clip, mission is very much something that you don't do in isolation, but which you do together. Just for a little test for the moment, uh, before we get into the passage, I'm going to put up some famous mission statements on the, wall, on the board there, and I wonder if you can guess what they are. So if we can have the first one, please, Lars. A computer on every desk and in every home. Now, I know you can't shout out uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from here in the fellowship, but does anybody know at home? Yeah, I see Brian. Brian, he's put his hand up. Have we got an answer on the chat function yet, Lars? The clue is in the word computer, desk and home. The answer is Microsoft. That is Microsoft's mission statement. The second one, to create a better everyday for the life of many people. Well, to create a better everyday life for the many people. I wonder who that could be. I've not actually shopped at this emporium, although I have obviously engaged with Microsoft. I wonder who it is. I'll give you a clue. It's something to do with furniture. Something, something very well known that involves meatballs and long queues. So you can probably guess that having given you the clues, it's Ikea. The third mission statement is slightly longer. To be Earth's most customer-centric company, where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online and endeavours to offer its customers the lowest possible prices. Well, it doesn't exactly run off the tongue, does it, as a mission statement? I wonder who that could be. It involves delivery and brown parcels and white vans that clog up the roads. I think you'll find it's the name of one of the two longest rivers in the world, otherwise known as Amazon. It doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, does it? A computer on every desk and in every home, yeah, that's okay, to create a better everyday life for many people, yeah. I wonder, Amazon, perhaps you need to shorten your mission statement. I wonder what our mission statement would be as Christian believers. Well, I think the clue is in the passage that we've just read. Uh, and I think actually, and I'm going to talk about this a bit later on, I'll give you the answer now. The word is go. The word is go. The rest follows. The word is go. Okay. But whether we are a part of a church or involved in running a business, mission statements are all the rage. They often involve a few well-chosen words, perhaps with a snappy catchphrase, hoping to articulate the values and goals of the organisation or the church. A lot of time can be spent getting the statement just right. The real problem is, is can you actually go beyond the words? Can you go beyond the, the, the computer on every desk? Can you go beyond that to be the Earth's most customer-friendly, etc., etc.? They used the customer quite a few times there. Can you actually deliver is the bottom line. Can you deliver the promises that you've displayed? How committed are you as an employee in a business? Or how committed are we as church members to make it happen as we say we want it to happen? You see, we have been looking over these past few weeks, these encounters that people have with Jesus. They range from Jesus meeting travellers on the road to people in a locked room to a barbecue by the beach, and now here on a mountaintop where Jesus has asked them to join him, they receive their mission statement. They receive the, the next steps, as it were, for their life. 
Jesus is not going to be with them forever. In fact, he soon leaves them. He says, wait, wait in Jerusalem and something else is going to happen. After the 40 days, there's another 10. And then, of course, you have Pentecost. On many occasions, hundreds of times, Jesus appears to his followers and he convinced them that he really was alive. This isn't a ghost. Let's make this plain. This is the real, risen, alive Lord Jesus. He has risen from the dead. He wasn't asleep. It wasn't a conjuring trick with bones. He is physically alive. He was dead. He is alive. That is the heart of the Christian faith. That is what we are preaching and proclaiming now, my friends, to a world that needs to hear it. That is what our call is beyond COVID. Yes, input, it is important that we support, we care for others. But why are we doing that? Because we believe that Christ is alive and dwelling in us and in the power of the Spirit, encouraging us to go and to reach out to this world. When you stop and you look at all four of the Gospels and you look at the book of Acts, you find that the commission appears in every single one. I can list them for you if you like. But basically, in all four Gospels, towards the end, at some point, Jesus commissions his disciples. In other words, he gives them an idea of what it is that they are to do. But what does commission really mean? Well, let me give you an example. I've got an example here. This is my commission. And, and if you're watching, you can see that I'm wearing a cap that says Tourists CC on the front. Now, normally in cricket, you get a cap because you've done something spectacular. You've taken a lot of wickets or you've scored a lot of runs. That's never applied to me. I'm commissioned to tourists because I'm a team member. I'm a team player. The cap was awarded to me. The captain handed it to me at the end of the game and said, you're a member of the team now, here's the cap. Well, £10 did actually change hands for the cap itself. But you see, that's a bit like our Christian commission. We don't actually have to do something to be commissioned. We are commissioned. We are all part of God's call. You don't have to pay a tenner to get, well, you could pay a tenner and get this cap. I could get you one if you like. Um, they're quite good in hot weather. They go over your eyes. But in God's economy, we cannot pay for that which God gives us. We are given it, we are encouraged it, we are given that calling to go to the world. We're commissioned by Jesus, not on the basis of what we have done, but on the basis of what God invites us to get involved with. There's an invitation, a special invitation that commission involves. And we're invited to partner with Jesus. And this is the Great Commission, not simply an invitation to something, but an invitation to a way of living. This doesn't just stop with the disciples on the mountain. This is for all time. And see, this is the power of these encounters that Jesus has with his disciples, not just now, but for all time. And you know, when you really dig down, and when you look at this great commission, Jesus says, well, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. It reminds me of Genesis chapter 12 and what Abraham is being told of God restating that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, both heaven and earth. And that authority is given through Jesus to you and I to take to the world. I want to ask, but highlight three things very quickly, really, this morning. And the first one is this. What is the goal of our mission? What is it that we are really looking at? How can we help to transform lives, which is the goal of the gospel, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When someone is new in Christ, he is a new creation. The new has come and the old has gone. How can we become involved in transforming people's lives? Well, there's three things. Each beginning with W. The first one is this, works. How can we become involved in the commission? Do something. Shine your light. Go back to Matthew 5, verse 15. 14 to 16, so let your light shine before men that they will praise your Father in heaven. Not give you glory, not build you up, not brag you about. But actually Jesus says, get involved in this and do the things I ask you to do. Shine your light, speak your words. Like Peter and John did in front of the, uh, of, of the chief priests. 
You know, they were having to talk to the bigwigs of their day, high court judges. The Supreme Court, if you like, is their, is their day-to-day equivalent. And yet they spoke boldly, it says. Not boldly, they got hair. Boldly. They spoke out. They made it clear what they believed. And that's what, they, that's what we're called to do. It's not just your works, it's your words. And that's your second W. Preach the message. And if you look at the parallel picture of the Great Commission in Mark's Gospel, in Mark chapter 16, it says this, Mark 16, verse 15, go into the world and preach the good news. Preach, proclaim, speak out, make it plain to all creation. The goal of our mission, you see, is to trans- transform lives and to be part of it. We use what we do, we use what we can say, but actually we also expect God to work wonders. And that's the third W. For God to get involved means things will happen. Before the service, Brian and I were talking about so-called coincidences. I don't believe in those. God makes things happen. We do not know how. We cannot see sometimes why, but we know that it happens. Of all weeks, we chose to have that mission video when I'm preaching on Matthew 20, on this particular passage. Okay, is that a a move of God? Yes, I believe it is. Wonders will follow, but they will be wonders that God brings, not ones that we can create. And be careful about trying to create wonders and signs following. God will bring them, providing we are faithful and we are using the works and the words that are part of our commission. And you know, I mentioned earlier about our mission statement. Well, it's very simple. When you look at Matthew 28, 16, there is one imperative. And that imperative, in other words, a statement, is to go. Get on with it. Get out there. Get going. And okay, it it qualifies it because it says says these three things, doesn't it? It says about what we are to do. It says to us, and I need to just find the passage in Matthew as I've gone back to Mark. It says to us, Go and make disciples, baptising them in the name of the Son and teaching them. So going means that we disciple, means that we baptise, means that we teach. In other words, we help people grow up as believers. We help them be baptised, that is, immersed in God, recognising they make a public statement about faith. And the third aspect of it is teaching, growing in the knowledge of God. And yes, God can be known. There are those who say God can't be known, but he can be known because he has revealed us to us himself. Romans 1.21 speaks about God being revealed in creation. It, it, the scriptures also talk about God being revealed in Christ, in, in the cross and in the work that he has done. So that's the imperative. That is our mission, go. Go and do these things. Go and get involved in people's lives. That's effectively, I guess, that's what that's saying to us. Because to get involved in someone's life is to want to help them grow up to be something different and better. It's to want to help them grow up in God, to help them grow up and and be the people that God wants them to be. The second point I want to raise is this. What is the power behind our mission? We are not on our own here. And this is something I think that week by week has been demonstrated to me as I've looked at these passages and day by day as I've read the devotionals. We are not on our own. There is power behind our mission and it is the presence of Jesus. He says, I will be with you even until the very end of the age. Can you imagine anything beyond the end of the age? There isn't anything. This is infinity. He's always there. He's always with us. But of course we have the helper, God's Holy Spirit. You go back to John's Gospel, Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15, 16, Jesus talks about what the Holy Spirit uh, does, who he is, uh, and the impact that he has through them. And he says, you will be filled, you will have the Spirit of God, the Comforter, another of the same kind is what the Greek says. Just like me, he says, you're not going to be on your own. So there's the call of the mission, there's the power behind the mission. And finally, there's the plan for the mission. And here is where I want to challenge you as I challenge myself. 
First of all, are we prepared to be sent? Are we ready to go? If you go back to John's Gospel, John chapter 20, we'll go forward to John's Gospel. John 20, verse 21, and it's a verse that we've read before. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 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 And yeah, I'm looking at the screen and I'm saying you. God says through Christ, I'm sending you. Are you ready to go? Are you really ready to go now? Not in some, some week's time. Are we ready to go now as we prepare for lockdown being released? Are we ready to go now knowing that there are people out there who are anxious, caring, hurting, whatever? Are we ready to go now? Are we ready as a church to go and to rethink what we need to do and engage with the world around us? Are we ready to do it? Are we truly, truly ready to do it? Are we prepared, though? Because sometimes we can be ready, but not prepared in our own mind. The second thing is, will we take on board God's clear mandate? And there is a clear mandate in the Great Commission. And the clear mandate is to go. Will we go? Are we prepared to be sent? Perhaps. Will we go? That's another question. Will we go? My question is more like what's holding me back? I say that of myself as I say it of anyone else. And the final thing I want to say to you is, are we ready to take on board the power that God gives? Are we ready to, to move in the power of God's Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, so often ignored, but the one of whom Jesus speaks in Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, oh, and to the end of the earth. That's the plan. We've got to be prepared. We've got to get on and do it but we ain't going to get anywhere unless we depend upon the power and the infilling and the direction of God's Holy Spirit. And that means listening. And that means praying. And that ties in, links in so well with what we're looking to do now. If we are to be a mission-minded church, and there are no other churches that are not mission-minded, because that's our calling, to go and make disciples, to go and meet people where they are, to go and to bless people, there is no choice. But will we take on all that authority and power that God has for us? We cannot, will not be able to do it in our own strength. But will we take it? Will our radical faith mean that we take that message of the cross to a needy and hurting world? And, and please last, put my last slide up. That's our message. A broken person, but a risen saviour and a church on fire. You might be like Peter was, by the fire. We might be going through it, but I want you and I, I want this church to be on fire. And that's what mission is. Set far to go, set far to be. In Christ's name, amen. We've got one more song, but before we do that, I want to show a brief video clip just to kind of inspire us and then our final song. And then we'll meet together again with with our children and young people. So thank you, Lars, for our video. And then I'll ask Pete to close with a wonderful song.
Jared, a closing song is a modern working of what we would know as the creed, a statement of belief. It's the Hillsong version of it. Please, as you read the words, consider what that invites you to believe in and to commit to. Consider the Christ who this talks about. Thanks, Pete. Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Saviour, I believe in Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in. God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you rose I believe. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. I believe that Jesus Christ is I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion And in your holy church I believe in the resurrection When Jesus comes again For I believe